Today's November 18th, 2011. My name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. And we're at the History Center today with Mike Walsh. Mike is a Navy veteran, served in Vietnam, and has kindly agreed to come and share his story with us in connection with the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. Uh, Mike, we really appreciate you doing this, and it's, it's an honor to be able to hear your story today. You know, I hope it's interesting. Uh, I found it interesting to sort of look at what I did. And I'm looking forward to sort of go, going through this and hopefully telling you a little bit about what was going on in you know, a Navy destroyer during the Vietnam era. Would you give us your complete name <clears throat> and current address, please? Michael Gifford Walsh. And when and where were you born? Houston, Texas. Okay. Uh, and that was on July 6, 1942. Okay. And tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Well, interestingly enough, looking back on it, uh, uh, my dad was actually in Houston, Texas on, in training uh, in the Navy uh, during the early part of World War II. Uh, he, <clears throat> he ended up in the Armed Guard, which were a Navy detachment on merchant marines. And he was anywhere from uh, the Aleutian Islands all the way to Australia. Um, I uh, moved from Houston to Iowa for approximately six years and then grew up in Atlanta, uh, where I went to elementary school and high school. Okay. When did you join the military? I joined the military out of college uh, right after I finished the University of Georgia in, uh, let's see, that would have been January of 65. Uh, <clears throat> I went to high school in Atlanta uh, in Marist School. It was Marist College at that time, and I had five years of Army ROTC in high school, and then when I went to the University of Georgia, I had uh, two years of Air Force, that being a land-grant school. All the males had to take two years of ROTC, so when I got to the Navy, it was my third service, and, and the experience uh, that you gain being in the military and around the military it was really beneficial once I got to OCS. Uh, it really helped just the whole transition. Did you uh, enlist or were you drafted or did you get a commission out of college? Well, actually at the time, if you weren't married, the, uh, either you had to continue your education or volunteer unless you wanted to be drafted. And my, uh, dad having been in the military and my swimming coach in college and a lot of my dad's friends uh, haven't spoke very highly about the Navy. Um, that's how I decided to go to OCS in Newport. Okay. Interestingly enough, uh, I've been around the Northeast a little bit. The saying about Newport is there are only two seasons, <laughs> July and winter. <laughs> but uh, And I got there in February, it's pretty cold. Ugh. And uh, they had a, a certainly that only the military would do this, but they had a program which they called a fire watch. And so they had watches that you would march around the uh, outside of the buildings to protect them and notify anybody if there's a fire. So you would uh, report to duty on your whatever the hour you're supposed to be there at midnight, four in the morning, getting into the watch situation. And you would take a parade all the way around the exterior of the area of the OCS. And the snow could be this high and the wind blowing. It was just sort of a wild experience for a kid from Atlanta, Georgia. I found out what they were talking about when they said July and winter. Um, but I grew up as a typical young kid here and played sports, just like everybody else. I went to school and really loved our country at the time, and I think a lot of the <clears throat> swimming coach in college and my dad being in the military is why I chose the Navy and decided 
to go ahead and you know, choose my own service as opposed to end up as a army private somewhere. Talk about your training, where you went, what you were being trained to do, and uh, some of your memorable experiences during your training. Well, <clears throat> OCS uh, basically trains you for being a Navy line officer. Um, several people in my class went to supply school from OCS, which was an additional uh, educational process whereby they became supply officers. Uh, some people went and became pilots. Um, but anyway, the line officer was typically sent to a ship or a shore duty for various uh, jobs that are available. The, uh, I, I was assigned to a ship, uh, interestingly enough, out of 13 people. Um, in, in my experience at OCS was just incredible with a bunch of great guys who were very qualified. Um, we were color company, uh, as I uh, shared with Joe earlier, when we were, uh, I almost feel like this guy was, was uh, hand-picking people because we just had a great bunch of guys and we, we, we went out of there. Uh, with flying colors, so to speak. They had a color company com competition. And this same company, or color company, uh, as far back as I knew about almost. Um, but uh, so the training there was basic training, so to speak. From there, I went to San Diego and was um, spent uh, two, I guess, pretty much two months in two or three different schools. Um, after OCS, it was a welcome experience. No one, we were headed, I was headed to a ship that was home port in Yakuska, Japan. The first squadron that was really sent to the uh, Westpac, they called it, the Western Pacific, uh, as Vietnam began to sort of heat up. And uh, it was almost like a vacation because uh, we were sitting there at the beach <clears throat> after classes and, and, you know, just it was a fun experience for me. I'd never been to California before, so it was, uh, again, like Newport, quite different than Atlanta. <laughs> but uh, uh, I did it. so I was commissioned in July of 65, went to San Diego and uh, joined the ship, which was the USS George K. McKenzie, which Joe told me this is the time I need to hold up my picture. Okay. And um, it was a destroyer. Hold that up a little bit more, and I'm going to zoom in on it. All right. We got a crack in the glass. That's okay. The we... picture's faded a little bit, but it was. This was my home for two and a half years. Okay, we got a good picture of it now. That's good. <clears throat> But anyway, uh, this picture was actually taken by me after I had uh, been transferred from the ship on a little wire in a little box seat. Uh, and at, when I was over there, there wasn't much going on on the flight deck except they were refueling my ship, so I just happened to get to the point where I could take that picture. Okay. Uh, but the uh, first. The real first year I was on that ship, uh, we, we were involved in a lot of various activities uh, because we were one of the early ships over there, and I thought I'd just list a couple of places we went okay. to. Um, as I mentioned, the ship was home port in Yakuska, Japan. Uh, we, we participated in the Taiwan Patrol, which was a <clears throat> actually a, a, a government uh, arrangement with uh, Taiwan to put two Navy ships on duty all the time in the Taiwan Straits. And this was because uh, the Taiwanese didn't exactly get along with the Chinese. And so uh, our ally Taiwan 
somehow got the government to agree to this. So for 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, there was a Navy destroyer in Taiwan Straits in the event something happened out there. But um, the, we did get involved in, in uh, carrier patrol or carrier support with aircraft carriers right off of Vietnam. Uh, those, those guys flying missions over North Vietnam. Talk about that a little bit. Well, typically that would be uh, the uh, carriers operated with flight ops out in the, in the Gulf of Tonkin, and they flew missions over Thailand and over North Vietnam and South Vietnam. Wherever the activity was, they had different missions that they were flying and we would, we would assist them um, being available in case they had various, any kind of a accident of sorts. And it was, it was interesting duty. Um, you know, typically that stuff happened in the daytime, but a lot of times they'd be flying at night and that got sort of exciting for the pilots, I'm sure. But yeah. uh, as a matter of fact, we, we did have some pilots come over just to see how life was. <clears throat> the McKinsey, it was roughly 400 square feet. The aircraft carrier is over 1,000 feet. We had three or 400 people. They had up to 5,000 people, including the, you know, the ship's company as well as the pilots and the air wings that came aboard. So it was a totally different lifestyle. We got mail whenever we could find it. Uh, they got mail frequently and they had a TV station on the ship. They knew always knew where they were because they had satellite navigation. We'd be out there sometimes when we were by ourselves shooting stars to try to locate where we were. Huh. <clears throat> the uh, and it's hard to believe to me. It's hard to believe that it, in that day and time when they could basically push a button and know where they were. Uh, our navigation equipment on our ship wasn't anywhere close to that. As a matter of fact, sometimes not knowing where we were, we would just position ourselves 2,000 yards from the aircraft carrier and we knew we were, they were going to run aground before we did. <clears throat> but um, another thing we did, we uh, were involved in is a secondary landing location for the Apollo missions. and. Uh, Typically, the idea was, as you probably remember from history, they would land there, the, the, these satellites would come in off of Canaveral in the Atlantic, and there was another place off the west coast um, that I think was a third landing place, but the secondary landing place was about 500 miles uh, east of Guam. So there were two ships involved in that. One would stay in port, one would go out on um, on station as they were about to land, them, in case they had bad weather on the East Coast, which was fun. Uh, it was an interesting mission and something a little different. The uh, other thing we did was inshore support, and this was South Vietnam, and this was uh, another sort of an interesting mission. You got uh, 400 people on a ship. And the worst thing that could happen there, I think, probably was running aground because we were in very shallow waters. I often wondered who did these maps and surveys to show us how deep the water was. Huh. When you think of that, <clears throat> because we were doing illumination, and fortunately, uh, and one reason I guess I joined the Navy instead of uh, letting the Army draft me was never really liked the idea of fighting in the jungles. You know, I really felt for those guys, but we would sit there out and, and in different periods of time, a half an hour, every half hour, every 15 minutes, we'd send illumination up where we would <clears throat> shoot these shells out and they had parachutes on them and they'd come down with light and it would light up the whole area where these guys were in the jungles so that they could see if the military, if the Vietnamese were, the Viet Cong come out at night and they just wanted to see where, what was around them <clears throat> to make sure they weren't being overrun. What type of communication did you have with the troops on the ground? <clears throat> they would essentially, we would be told where to, you know, and what 
uh, location to drop those things by okay. lat latitude, longitude, okay. and you know from when you'd sit, you shoot one up, and if uh, they wanted to move it, they'd tell you, you know, move it 500 yards from the west or the east or the northeast. And so <clears throat> we did have communications with the shore, so they'd tell us basically where to put it. Um, and it's interesting because I had talked to some people that were in the jungles and had that coming in on them, and they said they really appreciated it. But, you know, again, I, as, as you look at <clears throat> what you did and what you were doing, really didn't feel like we were much part of the war. It's pretty safe. The worst thing I had to worry about was the air conditioner be working in my stateroom when I got back to the ship, which wasn't always working. But uh, Well, you were part of the war. <clears throat> we were there. <laughs> Because you, you might have saved some lives on those troops on the ground with that illumination. Well, hopefully it was helpful. Um, you know, looking at my notes here, I, I guess that tour of duty, which was about a year, we were in Sasebo, Japan. We were in Guam doing the Apollo stuff. We were <coughs> in Wake Island, uh, home port of Yakuska, Subic Bay of the Philippines, and Hong Kong. Uh, and this again was various missions going on with the uh, with the ship being one of the few that were out there. And some of these things like Taiwan Patrol, we had you know contractual agreements the government did, so we were doing the you know the various jobs available out there. And then they were bringing additional ships in from the West Coast as the, the you know doing more stuff around Vietnam itself. You know, one thing about that time in my life uh, was the, um, my mother died and I came home in January or um, December, actually got in Atlanta on Christmas Eve and she died the end of January and then I, uh, so I was home on emergency leave and I returned to the ship in uh, February of, of, uh, of 1966 and as I did when I first went to the ship, I had to go through a roundabout travel, uh, I guess, a sequence of events with the various travel, starting off in, in San Francisco to Anchorage, Alaska, to Japan, and then to the Philippines in the, in the case of emergency leave. I was in the Philippines about two weeks trying to catch a ship. But uh, it's just amazing uh, how those experiences help you cope uh, and, and sort of learn the way of the world as far as travel is concerned. Uh, we would be on all kinds of planes. Uh, one time when I was in the Philippines, I actually went out on a oiler to try to catch the ship, which was had left there and was in port in Taiwan, so I went back to the Philippines flew up to Taiwan, took a train down to Kaohsiung, which is at the other end of Taiwan, to join the ship. But, uh, and unfortunately, the only uniforms I took home were blues, which are pretty hot when it's about 95 degrees. And so, you know, I was barring, barring clothes from fellow officers at the, at the BOQ and everything else, but, uh, it's, uh, it was an exciting time and, and, you know, you just sort of make things do. Um, some of the assignments I had on the ship, I was involved in communications uh, early on and the first lieutenant, which is in charge of the deck <clears throat> and all the painting on the outside of the ship, all the people who uh, really did a lot of the duties outside and around the ship during, as you saw in this picture, uh, when we were doing the refueling, it was an awful lot. The deck people do all that. Um, and then, obviously, communications is pretty much explanatory. We did have signal flags when we were in, <coughs> in company with other ships. There were a lot of signals involved. It was sort of an interesting study in itself. Um, we used to stand watches four on, and then you'd be probably 12 off. <clears throat> and then you'd circle around and, and you'd have four more hours of duty on the 
and that's the, the watch is up on the bridge of the ship. Uh, just that's the operation of the ship. And on top of that, you got people you're responsible for, and in addition to that, you got your own job, which entailed a whole lot of paperwork and that sort of thing. So it's it's. It's sort of funny because as busy as you seem to be, you never got the job done. I mean, it was, you had a combination of things you were trying to do. And then all of a sudden you got to take a four hour watch. And then somewhere in there you try to get some sleep. But, um, and then if you're involved in act like that illumination or later when I was over there the second tour, shore duty, uh, you know, that sometimes you go a day without hardly getting any sleep. And, and it, it was just the way life was on the ship. Um, the, uh, the one thing I didn't say early on was we, we did have, uh, we were part of Desron 3, which was uh, four different uh, destroyers that were, I think I mentioned, homeported in Japan. Um, then in 1970 or 66, in July, the ship came back to the west coast um, and uh, we were home ported in Long Beach, California. The ship was going through a, a rehab period where they, uh, one of which, one of the things we did was uh, brought a whole new weapon system aboard. Uh, <clears throat> we were in dry dock so that they repainted the exterior of the ship and, and did a lot of other things as far as a total rehab of the ship. The, uh, the weapon system they brought aboard was actually a helicopter, a remote control helicopter, which um, actually picked up torpedoes and with the, uh, with the radar on the ship, we controlled where we put that, and then with the, with the uh, sonar under the water, we could tell where the enemy was. Theoretically, this is, the system was not without fault, but the sonar would, under the water, tell you where the submarine was, and then you would lift the helicopter out with the radar, control it, so you, you got it on a scope, and so you fly the, the uh, helicopter out in front of the, um, the submarine, enemy submarine, and <clears throat> drop the torpedo and it would go down and circle around and search out the submarine. And um, that was the theory. We never did it actually except in practice. <clears throat> we did hit a submarine by accident almost because it, 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 we dropped it so close it just hit the submarine. The idea was not to hit our own submarines, but. Uh, it was a dummy, so it didn't hurt anything, but uh, the system had a lot of flaws. It was an expensive system. Later, they replaced it with actual helicopters, uh, the remote, but it was, a, it was an interesting system, and it was fun to operate it. I went to St. Clemente for the training from Long Beach, and uh, it was, it was a, as a young kid, it was an interesting experience. It was like having your own play toy. But uh, it, the system did work. <clears throat> it just, that was early on and it really had some flaws. Um, but after the uh, rehab and refresher training down in San Diego, six, which took basically a year of, of time. Now is this after <clears throat> your first tour? Yeah, this okay. is back on the West Coast. Okay. And then uh, we did another six month cruise or to the west back, Western Pacific, through Hawaii again, and then uh, basically did a lot of the same things. Uh, I qualified on that trip as an officer of the deck, which meant that I was taking the captain's place when he wasn't on the, on the uh, uh, well, in, in control of the ship. Uh, Talk about that. What what responsibility you had, and what what dangers there were, if a mistake was made. Well, there's. It's sort of interesting because <clears throat> the um, the uh, idea of um, 
operating a ship, I mean, there are two things going on in a ship all the time. There's a group of people that are up on the, on the bridge driving the ship. Then you got all the other people doing their jobs around the ship, always preparing for what the duties of the ship. But the people on the, on the bridge operating the ship are there with the captain. And the captain's always responsible for the ship. Doesn't matter what happens, who is the officer of the deck, the captain is responsible for what that ship does. If something's not right, he gets, uh, he, he's the one that gets the uh, ax. So if, if I'm driving the ship as an officer of the deck in his place because he's either sleeping, eating, or just takes a break from the bridge, and I run into a ship or I run aground, chances are it's not going to help my fitness report, but he, it's going to ruin his career. So he only qualifies people he thinks are capable of fulfilling his duties on the, on the bridge. But the excitement of it all is, at 23 year old, as a 23 year old young kid, uh, you have the responsibility of 400 people's lives. And, and I'll never forget the first time I was uh, had duty. That was an experience. But the first time I ever had duty at night, it really hit me as to how serious a responsibility that was. <clears throat> because you're always looking around as, when you're at sea, as you do in any boat or ship, for other ships. And, uh, and you know, I got a few ships in the dark coming around that first time I had the duty, and it really hit me. What, what responsibility that they put in your lap, and it really makes you grow up. <clears throat> and I think it's a great experience. I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, trade it for anything I did. As a matter of fact, that capability and learning how to drive the ship. The only people driving ships are OODs. So when we went into port, you know, the first time I did that on my own with the captain standing, you know, right here waiting to make sure you didn't do anything uh, that was going to be, he was, he was going to be held responsible for. Um, it's just, it's something you, you really take pride in. Um, but then, um, why don't we take a break? I'm going to lose my voice a little bit. i a little coffee. All right, so now we're, we're on that second tour. Okay. Uh, which was a six-month tour from about June of 67 to December of 67. Um, and I'm now qualified as an officer of the deck, which was certainly an ex experience. One thing I did find out is that why I qualified on the early part, actually I think I qualified uh, with the, the captain that we had during that refresher training period in San Diego. And so the second tour, um, I typically was the officer of the deck um, on a regular rotation with three or four other people. And I was Lieutenant JG and not a department head where the other qualified officers of the deck were lieutenants. Some of, one of whom was uh, actually qualified through a school they started and that was destroyer school. But I quickly found out that my experience, that first tour, which qualified me to be an officer of the deck, was a whole lot better than whatever this destroyer school was teaching because um, <clears throat> the, the on, I mean, the, the experience I had on that original cruise, or the first cruise, was just apparently um, hard to teach in a classroom because what was going on is they were taking young guys who had done one tour and by the time they went through the destroyer school they would be qualified they'd be uh, lieutenants in rank but they didn't have that experience that I gained so it was sort of like on the, on the site tra training really had I mean I didn't even realize how much I'd learned it was like the first time I went on watch 
as a young ensign, after being an OCS and all these schools I've been to, uh, I sat up there on the bridge as, as a J-O-O-D, <clears throat> which is the OOD's assistant. And he, he, that job was doing whatever he told you to do. But you would sit there, you had about five or six people there, and again, this was in the dark. And there'd be two or three speakers around the pilot house on the bridge. And, you know, one guy would be in the CIC behind you, somebody might be a wa on watch somewhere in the ship, somebody might be on watch on the bridges. Um, you're hearing radio transmissions from other ships. You got a, uh, a radar screen showing various contacts in light. You know, you can, you don't know who they are, they're just a contact. And I'm standing up there and I'm, I've, I've had all this training and I'm looking around and this guy's moving, telling people what to do. And uh, I thought, there's no way. I'm ever going to be able to do what he's doing. I mean, he's he's having the guy steer a different uh, course. There are ships around us. Uh, they, he's telling them to go faster, increase the speed, slow the speed. And, and meanwhile, you got all these people talking to you, giving you different information that you got to evaluate in order to do this you know, job that you got. And I'm thinking, there's no way, you know, a year later I'm doing it, and really doing it without even thinking. I mean, it's just amazing how much you learn um, so fast at that age. I mean, it, it really helps you grow up. But another another uh, job we had, um, and this was sort of an interesting thing, um, after all that time, the uh, North Vietnamese had built these uh, bunkers with pretty good sized guns on the North Vietnam coast. Well, apparently somebody decided we should take destroyers and actively seek these people out and, and, and destroy them. Why they didn't do it with airplanes, I have no idea. It just does, it baffles me to tell you the truth. But, you know, as a young patriotic kid, and that's the reason I think I joined the military, didn't go to Canada or something, but I mean, um, you, you just basically did what you were told to do, and uh, and I think that's a lot of what the military does. And the politicians, you're not sure wh where they sit in this thing. It's sort of like uh, I'm sure a lot of people after they served in Vietnam wondered why we were there and what we were doing, but. Uh, but, but anyway, so the, the mission was for two destroyers to go into the shore, get on a course, and start shooting at these guns. Well, I'd already seen messages where they were shooting back. And, you know, in a few instant, instances, we had, <clears throat> had some ships hit and some people hurt. But for the most part, I guess we were making some headway where airplanes would have been so simple. And nobody gets in harm's way. I just, I really, it's something I look back at and, and then you wonder why were we doing that? And I'm sure everybody that's ever been in some kind of a conflict has the same thoughts. But the long and short of it is the day finally came when we are going to do this. And so the two ships get together. We got a mission. It's set up at a time. And <clears throat> we go in toward the shore, turn on the same course and start shooting and everything's going fine and so you know then we there's a course to exit and everything's fine well the second time we do it and we only did it a half a dozen times then but the second time we did it you know we're all in battle gear i got a some kind of helmet on i got a flak vest on and uh <clears throat> We, we go in and um, as we turn and start shooting, the other ship's about, uh, I guess, 2,000 yards away. 
And all of a sudden, I look over there, and it was almost a surreal experience, and these little white puffs start coming out of the water. It's almost like something shooting up. But what it was, was the enemy was shooting at the other ship. It wasn't coming around us, didn't hit us, didn't hit them, thank God. But, I mean, they were literally out in front of the ship, and the ship's heading out, and I'm, I'm, I just remember thinking, you know, this is war. This is what war is all about. And we're finally in the war, and I hope they don't stop shooting at them and start shooting at us. But that was the closest I ever got to the war. And, uh, and out of about six or eight times we did that, um, that was the only time that we ever got shot at. Uh, I don't know, and I never knew if our rounds were hitting anything. There was an airplane, small plane up there, <clears throat> sort of telling us where we were and trying to train us back if we were off target. But uh, as best I know, we hit some and they missed us. So I guess that was a pretty good experience. About how far offshore were you? <clears throat> well, you had mentioned that earlier about the experience. And I think I said I, I couldn't believe how close we were getting when we were doing that illumination in South Vietnam. But there was no danger of anybody really shooting us, although there were some small boats in the water. You all often wondered if uh, any of that, anybody like the, what was it, the cone or whatever that ship that was in. Yeah. I mean, all they got to do is get up close enough with some kind of something and you could have a problem. We literally were hitting sandpans. That you you know you're up on the bridge so you're looking right down at the water you're 40 feet above the water or something you could hear these guys hollering because we we didn't have any lights on doing that typically and the sand pans wouldn't show up on the radar because they're wood and radar only picks up metal yeah. so we we were we'd be creeping along there and you'd hear some guy up there, hey, hey, hey. well he was literally bouncing along the bow, because the bow is like this, and he just, you know, you push him, sort of push him out of the way. I mean, you might tip him over for all I know, but you couldn't really see him in the dark. But, so we were very, we were within a half a mile of the coast okay. doing that. And what kind of weaponry were you using? Well, let me just clarify that. When we were doing the shore bomb bombardment in North Vietnam, we wouldn't be in that close maybe five miles or what we but, but, but you were typically I think once we went in and turned to do the shooting you had about a mile or two miles where the exits when you exit there were about two miles where you were still within range of their guns so you had two miles and it was a slow two miles when yeah. they're shooting at you yeah. Um, until you were basically out of range. Okay. Now that's one reason they brought the Iowa back in, I think it was Iowa, New Jersey, a couple of World War II cruisers with the 16-inch guns. They could literally shoot over Vietnam. I mean, they had a range way beyond the capability of our guns. But they brought those back to do something. And again, was that political? Think of the money we spent bringing those two big old barges, I mean, they, the cruisers are huge, bringing those back into commission to do that one job. Yeah. Was it a work for them? The more I think about it, I never really thought about it a lot since then, but, you know, you, an airplane could have just handled that job so much easier. But it was what it was. You know, one other exciting, uh, I say exciting, it was really tragic, uh, event of, of the, my second tour was one day we got a, a uh, radio message saying that there was a fire on the Ariskin, which is an aircraft carrier. And <clears throat> it, it was interesting because as you, we, were, we were by ourselves at the time, or maybe we were with another aircraft carrier. I can't remember. I think we might have been with another aircraft carrier. But you really didn't see a lot of ships out there. Um, and probably purposely they were maneuvering to keep them sort of separated because it was typically an aircraft carrier with the company, the company being a couple of destroyers. Well, the Ariskany had a fire, and the fire originated apparently by when the ships were on the deck 
and get ready to do a major launch, which meant there were a lot of, uh, I don't mean ships, aircraft on the deck of the Oriskany. The, uh, and they're all armed, heavily loaded, ready to go, take off and do these missions. A, uh, accidentally, one of these rockets just took off. It went through, hit another plane that was fully loaded with bombs, and the bombs blew. And I, don't hold me to this, but I think the aircraft carrier deck is about this thick, solid steel. It blew holes in the deck. Um, 44 people were killed, and unfortunately, as best I remember, a lot of them were pilots because it just happened to be over where the pilots lived, where the explosion happened, and um, so they lost, well, uh, the number I remember was 44, and I think most of them were pilots. But <clears throat> the thing that I remember most, we ended up getting some kind of award, but we, uh, they told us, you know, the Riskinies got a fire, you know, head over toward the Oriskany. So we head over toward the Oriskany, and as we approach now, this is, I mean, again, I'm trying to paint a little picture here, but a destroyer, we're for, our bridge is 40 feet above the water. I think the deck on an aircraft carrier is maybe 100 feet, so they stick up way up high. So as we approach the Oriskany, we don't see the Oriskany at first because it's over the horizon, but we see this black smoke going up. And again, you know, as a young kid, you're thinking, oh, what the heck has happened? And then you start getting details, you know, about what happened. And I'm, you know, and you see this massive amount of smoke. And my thought was, there are 5,000 people over there. It, what if it sinks? Where are we going, you know, what happens? Anyway, you, you start just imagining things. As we get closer, then you start seeing the carrier itself, and you're still seeing this huge, massive amount of black smoke going up, because a lot of bombs blew. I mean, I don't know how many, but it was uh, a, a big explosion. And the ship was stopped. Uh, ships are built incredibly, uh, you know, you don't know, but they're all compartmentalized. And typically when you go to battle, you close all the hatches that you usually walk through and, and all that. So you got these little boxes. Hopefully if you get sort of a hole here in this box and it's, it's got uh, doors on either side, you know, and all these boxes. Are, anyway, the ship only has a certain amount of vulnerability. And that's exactly what happened in this case. You know, they, they were able to com sort of control the area of the ship. I mean, I'm, I'm envisioning the thing sinking. You know, how can it withstand all this? Anyway, we get up alongside, and we did pick up a couple of guys who had literally jumped off the ship because there was fire behind them. And I think they were from the, the area where they, they actually put the parachutes together and <clears throat> for the pilots. Anyway, they, they, they jump. The only reason they jump, and I'll, I'll tell you, the screws on an aircraft carrier are bigger in this room. And to jump off a ship, knowing that screws at the back, uh, and you know, maybe you're jumping from 80 feet. Yeah. I mean, it's you wouldn't be jumping if you had an alternative. Mm -hmm. And we found these guys, I don't know, a couple of miles behind the uh, carrier. So we picked them up. And then we come alongside the carrier, and we've got our gun, our hoses, you know, trying to help put out the fire. Now, I thought that was crazy. I thought the captain was nuts. I mean, you want to try to help, but we're sitting there with this couple of gun mounts <clears throat> in the in the uh, sections below the gun mounts, typically are where they help keep all the ammo. <clears throat> Sorry. And so we pull up alongside. There's two or three gun mounts over here. You got that fire raging up there. <clears throat> They're trying to get the fire under control. We're shooting, trying to, I mean, it was like a pea shooter kind of thing. I, I, but anyway, we did that for about an hour or two. 
And finally, the fire was basically, I guess, contained. <coughs> contained. Wow. It was, I mean, it was a real tragedy, and, and it was, and it was nice to try to help. And I think yeah. picking those guys up certainly was helping yeah. them. Yeah. But um, you know, it's something I'll never forget. Yeah. Um, but uh, again, that basically, other than some of the same kind of things we did before. Uh, the six months ended and we did some other things similar to what we'd done on that first cruise and um, headed back to California. Um, I won't go into a whole lot of detail, but on the way back to California, I was notified that I was being transferred to Washington, D.C. I had six months of active duty left. And, um, which was an experience in itself. We didn't wear uniforms in Washington. And um, um, I had really, I can't remember ever seeing more than one or two admirals. And now I'm on a staff with like, out of 114 officers, 10 or 15 of them were admirals. I was the only Lieutenant JG. There were two lieutenants or something, and then half a dozen lieutenant commanders, well, that's not true, probably a half a dozen lieutenants, and then everybody else was lieutenant commander, and there were a whole lot of commanders and captains. But um, I, the, the interesting thing about that little tour of duty was I decided to get out of off active duty at the end instead of extending, but it was a time when uh, Martin Luther King was killed, and the riots in Washington were just incredible. They had curfews. Uh, there were several days we didn't work because the area <clears throat> where they put up the tent city was right next to the Navy base or the Navy uh, building. So we didn't, it was just a, a time of turmoil, I guess. <clears throat> but um, then I got off active duty in nine. In June of 1968, went back to Atlanta, joined the Navy Reserves uh, in, uh, in June of 68, or soon after that, got involved primarily in the Naval Control of Shipping, which was a, a port control operation. It was also involved in if, if in fact, in the future, we got into a major conflict. We might be uh, moving merchant marine uh, ships in mass with with uh, military uh, protection. Uh, I, I did that until nine. I guess it was sometime in 1989 when I finally retired from the uh, reserves. But the reserves were interesting. Um, <clears throat> we we did two week active duty periods annually and, um, and met weekly um, or monthly in reserve centers here in Atlanta. <clears throat> but that's pretty much my military recollections. I retired as a captain in the reserves and lived happily ever after. I want to ask you a few more <clears throat> questions about your Sure. Service. Did you have much contact with civilians when you would go into these various ports while you were serving off the coast of Vietnam? Not a lot, but you did go into port. That was the best part of it. You tried to, you would hope you were in port all the time. Obviously, we weren't. <clears throat> I think the longest we were not in port was about uh, 30 days. And that was one thing I don't think I mentioned, but during one of those two tours, we did a, did we mention Taiwan, the Taiwan patrol? We talked about it earlier, but by contract, the, the U.S. government but, and our ally, Taiwan, had an arrangement where there'd be a Navy ship in the Taiwan Straits all the time. And we were, <clears throat> got involved in a typhoon out there and, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and I think we were out over 30 days, which is a long time on a ship of that size. We didn't get mail. 
very often on something like that, you might not get a meal for 30 days. Sometimes my biggest struggle was trying to find out the football school from <laughs> my University of Georgia to see how they were doing, and I wouldn't find it out till 30 days after they played. That's, but, uh, that's tough. <clears throat> well, it was. It, uh, but the, uh, the times at sea were pretty much limited to a couple of weeks, typically. And you'd duck into a port in the Philippines. I mentioned some of the ports. Uh, but I found it to be very, very interesting uh, just to be there and see the countryside and the way people live in different countries, so different from, you know, what I was used to, yeah. and uh, some beautiful country. Um, it's, it's hard to believe, I, you know, I, I heard them talking about Vietnam like it was a Riviera, and the one time I did get close to the I mean, literally close to any real shore or beach. Uh, I mean, it was beautiful. If there wasn't a war going on, it'd be, and it is, I think, now. A lot of people have been back over there and uh, reminded me, I think I said something to you before when we started this, my trip to Normandy. You go through some of that French countryside and see the pretty land and the homes and everything, and, and then you're look at the movies of the war and it's just yeah. war can really make a place look ugly in a hurry. You had previously mentioned uh, before we started the interview something that I think people would find interesting. Uh, you showed the picture of your ship and you took it from an aircraft carrier and you described how you would get from your destroyer to the aircraft carrier. Uh, Talk about that. Well, I think I said something about a, a little uh, seat in a box on a uh, couple of wires. But what they actually did was they, you had one wire and on a little pulley, the, uh, the seat that you sat in, it was literally a little cage. It was pulled by two ropes and, uh, you know, one rope on one ship and one rope on the other, and they would pull one and loosen the other, and you would ride the wire over the other ship and back. And it was held taut by typically a bunch of uh, the, the line or the deck officers or the deck enlisted who were on the other side of our ship. But, uh, you know, if you saw that picture, there was a big wave splashing up uh -huh. against the ship and the ship's rocking as well as doing this as those waves hit it. So a lot of things can happen, not all good, um, you know, and from time to time the, the chair actually goes in the water, but, you know, you uh, typically, you're, it's a box kind of thing, so you're not going to go anywhere, you might just get a little wet. Um, you know, and also told me sometimes it, I'm not sure that uh, some of the enlisted people who maybe didn't like somebody, maybe an officer type, might just dip them in to, for drill. But fortunately, when I went over there, I didn't have an issue. Um, but I also was picked up, I told you, I think, earlier about going out on an oiler trying to find the ship. Well, once uh, they, they were going out on... on uh, Control, they were going to be out there a while, so I, they picked me up, took me over to a carrier, and then I ended up going back in to port on the carrier, but they picked me up from a helicopter. You mentioned you've been in helicopters. The helicopter came in over the bow of the oiler and dropped a wire down with a little strap. So I get in there, put the strap around me, and they say, hold on, and they start lifting me up into the helicopter. You know, as you get up about 10 or 15 feet off the deck and you're looking at this monster ship coming right at you and in the aircraft carrier somewhere not too far, you, they lift you up and they went over and dropped me and sat down in the aircraft carrier. But, I mean, it's amazing the kind of things you can get involved in uh, just because you're there and you're trying to get someplace. <clears throat> but um, but it, all, overall, it was just an incredible experience. Uh, 
the travel, you know, the responsibility, um, just being in these different places and different situations and having to cope with, with whatever it was you had to cope with makes you grow up. Uh, it's just an experience that some of these guys that I was in OCS with who went to uh, various shore duty, um, you know, they didn't have our experience. I mean, they, they had their own experiences and a lot of them were good ones. Um, but, um, but I'm excited about what I was able to do and it was fun and I, you get a certain amount of, I think it made me feel confident as I went out in the world that I could uh, do something and achieve something that uh, I could support my family and, and, and make it through life with, and, and the, the interesting thing, and, I, and you hear this all the time, I think we talked about it a little bit, is what was going on sort of with the people here, and I, I really never got tied up in much of that because I guess I just sort of was oblivious to some of it, but uh, you know, I'd be sitting in an airport with my uniform on, coming or going, and I'm thinking, I'm going to war, and uh, nobody knows where I'm going. Yeah. Furthermore, nobody seemed to care. Uh, you know, through the, some Vietnam uh, veterans group that you and I have been involved in, you know, we've either been on the front and seen some of the, what's going on with some of these kids today and trying to support them. There wasn't anybody doing that. Um, I don't even remember ever being anywhere where there was a USO. Yeah. But most of my travel was overseas, so there probably wasn't, wasn't any USO. But, yeah. uh, but uh, again, I, it didn't ever bother me much. Yeah. Uh, I never really thought about it. I mean, you, like some of the political stuff we talked about, I thought about it later. And now that you see all this support for veterans, I'm proud to be a veteran, and I'm, and I'm proud to be part of the support. But it just didn't seem to be there. Yeah. And I don't know the kids today even know what the Vietnam War was. Yeah. Doesn't get a lot of publicity. I guess it's in the history books. But uh, but again, I'm proud of what I did and I'm glad I did it. And it was a great grown-up experience. Before we finish, uh, spend a minute and, and tell us about your family, your children. My family is, uh, I have uh, one son who has three children, and he didn't join the military, but he's a very patriotic guy, and I think like a lot of people his age, um, they, were, they didn't have to go, and so they didn't. Um, I think he'd support those that did, and um, I have two daughters, both who have two children, and uh, they all live here in Atlanta. They're all within a couple of miles of my house. And um, I'm very proud of all three of them. And they're just, you know, I'm really excited about having seven grandchildren. Wow. Congratulations. And my wife, Jane, supported me throughout this. Is any, <clears throat> the special, well, I'm awful glad I wasn't married during my active duty days, but through the reserves. The time you take away from your family um, puts a burden on your wife. I always thought being on active duty would be very difficult on a marriage, especially the kind of stuff I was, you know, as much as I was going then. And I've had friends that uh, stayed in, and it, it was tough on them. Yeah. Was, some of them are married, and some of them are divorced. I will never forget the comment that my when I was, um, I guess that second tour of duty, I was a navigator and a ship secretary, which meant I was responsible for all the the uh, all the written uh, communications coming and going from the ship. It's sort of like the mail room and, and, and transmissions and letters and reports and all this sort of stuff. But in, in doing that, I was like the executive officer's assistant. And... Uh, and he and I were the navigators, so those were the two jobs that he held sort of in conjunction with one another. Great guy, had three or four kids, and I just said, how do you do this? I mean, do, you know, how do you keep your family going? And he said, you know, being gone six months a year on these, on these uh, 
deployments really makes me appreciate my wife and family to the point where, you know, when I'm back home, it's just a great experience and uh, it's a job, I got to do my job, but he said, I really, it really helps my time when I'm home. And, and I know this is not going to last forever, so, uh, it's, and I really thought that was a great way of looking at it yeah. because a lot of people um, had a lot of problems you know, yeah. with family life just because of, of, of all that time. Yeah. But um, there was... There's one it was a good overall more experience. item I want to be sure we get on the video. And <clears throat> if, if you um, would the show culture. us that, uh, raise it up, and number one, describe what it is, and number two, describe the reason that that uh, particular metal came into existence. Well, this, uh, I'm not exactly sure what you call it, to tell you the truth. I mean, it is a surface warfare uh, decoration emblem, is probably more appropriate. This is a bow of a, of a destroyer or a cruiser, and uh, has a pilot house on the top and some cross sabers. But, uh, and I don't know exactly, I mean, I have a feeling as to how it came about, but when I was on active duty, of course, you had, you wear this right here with your medals and, um, or your ribbons, whichever you're wearing uh, at the time, but uh, the pilots had their wings and uh, the submariners had their emblem for being in the submarine service and as I think about it, the supply officers, I think, had their own little emblem, but uh, so in order to, this came about, I believe, for people on ships like destroyers and cruisers <clears throat> and smaller combatants uh, so that, you know, they had a, an emblem as the Airedales or the pilots did. But I'm proud to have earned it and uh, it's, it was, a, it was uh, again, my time in the military was, I feel well spent and I, I enjoyed it and I'm glad I did it. Well, you should be proud and, and uh, mm -hmm. you served honorably and you, even though you say you weren't in the line of fire, you obviously were um, on more than one occasion. And before we finish, I'd like to give you a chance to say anything else you'd like to say, either a talk about anything you did not talk about that you want to get on record or any message you want to give to people watching this video. Well, I appreciate you doing this um, and I'm, I'm glad the country finds time to, and the money to maybe record some of this stuff. <clears throat> uh, when you first suggested I might do it, I really felt that uh, there wasn't really any need for me to do it. Uh, you need to find somebody that really did something, but we all did our something, and um, uh, you know, we just got a great country here, and I, I'm very concerned um, about the youth of today and the, I guess, the attitude of our government, and if something really bad happens, and I think there's an awful lot of scenarios where some bad things could happen. It's a whole different world today, and the terrorists, I think, present a problem a lot harder to deal with than Vietnam. I mean, in the end, if we had the if we had the need, we could have just taken care of Vietnam. The terrorists are such a widespread thing. Um, I just. I foresee a lot of problems, and I'm not sure that the youth of today and the politicians have the, the will to deal with it. We've always risen in the past to any need that, that, that really was there, but I'm not sure in the future that's going to be the case. But again, I'm glad you all are doing this, and uh, hopefully it will be something in the future that will help our country um, and our our people understand what it's what it's all about to take care of our country. Well, thanks for 
giving those thoughts that's meaningful and it'll be meaningful to people that watch this down through the years and and also thank you for your service uh, you I mean you made a difference in a lot of lives with the illumination of the for the combat troops on the ground and you rescued two people from that fire so you saved their lives so you should be very proud of what you did uh, you destroyed North Vietnamese bunkers which probably saved some lives so uh, you played a major part in what we did in Vietnam, and I just want to thank you for coming in today, and thank you for your service. Thank you.